Hey, Patrick. Hey, Michael J. Wow. I I can't believe this young standard format has already taken like a 90-degree turn to the left or something. It's it's a kind of at least. Lots of, <laughs> lots of stuff changed up this week, and I think it's exciting. Yeah, and this is leading up to the first standard Pro Tour in the middle of a set release, like in a long time. I mean, this is the Pro Tour coming up in Phoenix next month. This is the first time there's been one, you know, two months into a set in a long time. And they just announced the standard uh, ban, res- or the, well, everything. No changes to the ban restricted list for any format. So this is it. And the next ban restricted list isn't until next year, long after the next uh, set is out. Yeah, so uh, I actually want to start in a weird place. Uh, well, weird for us, I think, but I think a really the beginning? interesting point. Not the beginning. The <laughs> I want to start around Perfect Ten. Uh, yeah. Perfect 10, Adam Bialkowski's red-white approach deck from U.S. Nationals just outside of the top eight. Yeah. This this deck, at the same time, is not really like anything we've seen so far, but I think it, it's, it's almost implied by a lot of the conversation you and I were having at the end of last week. You were, like, you were listing a lot of these same kind of principles in building a deck, uh, potentially to take... Um, you know, take a an opportunistic angle on standard, but then on top of that, Bielkowski like doubled down on the combo angle of a of a board control deck, which is I don't even believe I'm saying that in a sentence. So uh, this deck's like a red white control deck, an approach of the second sun deck, but it's only got three approach of the second sun in the main deck. But he's got four copies of a brand new card. That I, I wasn't even sure was going to see any play. Sunbird's Invocation. Sunbird's Invocation, which is the uh, that weird enchantment that's five in a red. Whenever you cast a spell from your hand, reveal the top X cards of your library where X is that spell's converted mana cost. You may cast a card revealed this way with converted mana cost X or less without paying its mana cost, but the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. So in a random order, sorry. Random order. So I, I actually... I. I haven't I haven't played this interaction before, but I, I'm trying to see how this goes, right? Oh, no, it go, so it goes well. So if you cast Approach of the Second Sun, mm-hmm. if one of the other two is in the top seven cards of your deck, then you'll cast that second one. The second one will be the second. Uh, well, it goes to the second. It becomes the, the first one, right? Right. Like so. What the Sunbird's Invocation one will be the first one, which doesn't need to come from your hand. But when the one that came from your hand resolves, it's going to ask, "Was it the first sec- uh, uh, Was it the first one? Did it come from your hand?" The answer is yes. And two, have you played another spell named Approach of the Second Sun this game? And the answer is also yes. Now, you you do need to have one of the other two Approach of the Second Suns in the top seven cards of your deck. But if you do, you win outright. So, And otherwise, you can just use Sunbird's Invocation as a powerful howling, a personal howling mine that lets you play the spell for free and with selection. It's a little slow to get going, but it provides an overwhelming board presence and just card advantage over the course of a couple turns usually ending in an approach of the second sun so i i really like the red white board control angle on standard um the you know especially if you're going to think about going into this weekend that teamer was you know that was going to be one of the top decks if not the top deck in terms of people's people's minds mind space after after huey's win and i think Red White is like this awesome mix of reactive capabilities. Like it's a deck that's got magma sprays and abrades and lightning strikes for fast point removal. But then it has this really, really important element, which is that you can play Gideon of the Trials, and then Gideon of the Trials can force the opponent into playing two threats. Because they have to. They can't get through Gideon of the Trials with only one threat. And then that turns on all of your your settle the wreckage and your uh your fumigate angle on your deck 
uh, to it just it just makes it so that the opponent has to play into those cards. And so there's this whole like awesome angle against creatures, and there's so few creatures in this deck. Like there's almost no resistance that the that the team or energy deck can can put against this. The only quote unquote resistance it can do is to actually actively try to kill you. But that deck just plays a bunch of creatures, and this deck kills a bunch of creatures, which is you know it really really kind of just a favorable context for the deck. But then I, I just I'm really just kind of enchanted by what Adam did here because the whole. I have some incremental planeswalkers. I have a bunch of point removal. Or I'm using cards to kill a bunch of creatures. That's a bad angle against uh, other go wide or board control decks. So he he makes it a combo deck too. It's it's like a lot of stuff going on. I, this deck's really exciting to me. One of the things that he gets to uh, do with have like three Gideons, three Chandras, one Watley, and then virtual planeswalker Okatra the True. Or virtual planeswalkers, Vance blasting cannons. Um, when he's playing Sunbird's Invocation and this many different card advantage engines or cards that can take over the game, it's night and day uh, how different it plays out against uh, like blue black control. Because typically a blue black control deck makes life really really hard for an approach to the second sun deck. Search for Azkanta can just be ripping you apart. Meanwhile, if you ever try to go off, they just counter your your approach. Approach, and eventually uh, they just beat you with torrential gearhawks. But here, all these different non-creature threats punish them for being so reliant on fatal pushes and the like, or essence scatters or essence extraction, any of that stuff. So they have tons of dead cards, but then you end up just uh, being able to grind them out with all these planeswalkers and card advantage enchantments. And and even if they try to do something with Torrential Gear Hulk or Search for Azkanta or the Scarab God, most, not all, but most of your removal actually lines up pretty well, you know? Like even a Braid being able to hit Torrential Gear Hulk and four cast outs in addition to two Ixalan's Binding. Yeah, Ixalan's I... Binding is an interesting one, right? Oh yeah, it can it just locks out, um, you know, a uh, a thing. The scarab god. Yeah. Well, that's a big part of it, right? Is that it's not just that it's exiling one of the scarab god. It exiles. It's all exiles all. It exiles all three. So the like, there's also like just little angles on this that um, that one might miss. Like you can, for example, magma spray of the scarab god. Magma spray has the the text. You know, if the creature would die this turn, exile it instead, and then kill it some other way, right? So you can kill it with uh, the minus on Chandra, or you know, if if you've got enough mana, you can fumigate the Scarab God, but set it up with a Magma Spray, and that seems like a you know a mana and or card inefficient way of dealing with the Scarab God. But they've only got so many of the Scarab Gods, and you've got such an excess of creature interaction cards. Like, I think it's okay, especially when we're talking about the amount of card advantage the Scarab God would probably get them over the course of the game. Uh, it's just a little thing like that, I think, probably is, is useful to know. Uh, there are some things that I found to be opportunistic about this deck and also weird about this deck. One of okay. them is that I, I think the sole reason that this deck is viable this week is that you know, we were looking at a standard coming in where Mono Red was previously one of the top decks, but it's behind against Black Blue and behind against Teamer. This deck seems atrocious against Mono Red in Game 1 to me. Like, I I cannot imagine this deck not getting shredded by Mono Red. It's got a ton uh, of... I mean, if you just draw a couple cheap removal spells, like, if you had a good curve, if all your cards... I mean, I'm sure you're a big dog. But, like, <laughs> if you have the right curve... And then really? you just cast approach to the second sense for sure. If you just go magma spray into a braid, he has one in... magma spray at three a braid and one lightning strike. It, okay, it... so if you play an a braid on two, a Gideon on three, a Chandra on four, or a cast out for the, uh, you know, the Hazaret, and then on turn five you fumigate, turn seven approach, turn nine approach, and you win. And he just hits his land drop every single turn. Well, so that actually twenty five land to my no problem. cantrip deck. No, no, no. See, that actually speaks to my problem with this deck. I do not believe 
that this deck with 14 fours, a f like, four, no, f sorry, 15 fours, uh, two fives, and three sevens. I do not believe... You missed the four sixes, friend. Oh, God. Okay, so 15 <laughs> fours, uh, two fives, six... I'm sorry, four sixes. Three sevens. And three, three sevens. Oh, dear Lord, there's actually five fives. Oh, because of Huatli. Okay, so 15 so fours, I got, five I think, fives, I think everybody's got sixes. the message. This is a... If those were all creatures, Jamie Wakefield would love this curve. Got it. How, uh, yeah, I just don't, how are you going to get there? I think that this Shredded deck... by mono red. That's, that's, I, that's my assessment, right? Like, I, I just don't believe there's enough mana in this deck, period. Like, I'm a big fan of this kind of deck, and I like what he did with the approach to the second sun, Sunbird's Invocation, because I think it's quite novel. But in order for this strategy to be viable, in my opinion, I think he has to adopt some of the early game accelerator type cards he has to have cards like treasure map or um what's the, the what's the one that searches for land the the compass yeah thematic compass like you have to have something like that because otherwise you're you have these cards that are so expensive and some of them are like he's got r on Dude, one i would white, love white the white compass one. in this deck what i would love the compass yeah, in this compass deck that sounds awesome so good and like I, there's just, yeah, there's three things that I that that I would see as areas for improvement on this archetype. One of them is has to have compass and or treasure map because it, the curve that you're describing is just no bueno with 25 land. Like he's, he doesn't have one of the odds. challenges. Yeah, but then like, he's the, one of the problems. He's got four cast outs, but that's not nearly enough. Uh, but he needs them. The, but he doesn't have any. He doesn't have any other abrade targets. Oh. So like. You are. T it's not the end of the world necessarily, but like you got to admit that that's not exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Optimal. That well, I, like I said, I think it's only viable if Mono Red is not one of the most popular decks, and it's not like Teamer has so many abrades. Like they might have a couple, might have one even. So that that's one thing to me. Secondly, it's weird to me to have a two color deck that has no Field of Ruin, right? Like. This is the kind of deck that is so far behind against um, against uh, Search for Escanta and or like there's a bunch of cards like in, in that even like a flip treasure map. Like if the opponent flips a treasure map and you've got no field of ruin, you're just going to like, oh, I guess you just throw three cards and accelerate. That was pretty cool. My deck has no way to approach you on that vector, by the way, because it's just good cards that I have to pay for retail. That's the second one. And the third one is. This haphazard inclusion of Oketra the Crew and Angel of Angel of Sanctions, look, there's so few creatures in this deck that it just kind of guarantees that the teamer deck will have their essence scatter in their hand when you cast it. Like, it, uh, you just can't play those, in my opinion. Like, put sideboard creatures if you want, but, like, just guaranteeing that, you know, essence scatter is going to be turned on late in the game because he's not, he's not going to have Oketra on turn four. Like... He only has one. It's just that's just not how the math lines up. There's so, also fifteen fours. So there's a yeah, lot of competition. Yeah, for like turn four. Okay, Oketra is not better than the fourth Chandra, in my opinion. So it's and in a deck with so few creatures, I'm not sure that it's better than. I mean, I don't. I wouldn't play two Vance's Blasting Cannons in the main deck, but that's me. Um, but th those are the three areas of optimization for me. One, it has has to have a lower curve that can generate some sort of. Um, card or mana advantage second has have some access to field of ruin it, it, even in the sideboard it's like something then third these creatures make no sense to me it's just contextually in the in the in the marketplace of of the top end of the metagame they're just going to get essence scattered so what do you think about this uh sideboard transformation plan with four glory bound initiate three heart of kieran a captain lannery storm uh, three Regal Caracal and two Combustible Gearhulk as part of this giant transformation. Um, weird. It's weird. It's an exotic mix of... I like, mean, the, the technique is familiar, but this is an exotic mix. Like, Glorybound Initiate and Heart of Kirin, 
totally with it. Get it. Regal Caracal? Uh, okay, I guess. I could believe it, I guess. But then one Captain Lanteray Storm and two Combustible Gear Hulk. So kind of a, I think a mix. If I played a red-white control deck, I would play three Regal Caracal on my cyber, but I would ha- also have four Authority the console. I think the big problem that you have here is like this deck is so like other than beating them just straight up with approach of the second sun like beating them that way like this deck has is so far behind against tokens it's unreal like it's no it's, no, no 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 but maybe that's actually good then maybe it just gives it up but it doesn't have to you could just like, <laughs> play authority of the council was actually great in your worst matchup of mono red and like if your goal is just to live long enough to cast approach the second sun, I would rather have that card than a five casting cost version of that card, right? Like personally, I play all of them. I play like seven and like, and I would also make sure I had four magma sprays after sideboarding for red, but that's like, that's the angle I would take, but I feel like he's just half doing it and missing like, like Caracol is good against mono red, but authority of the councils is good against mono red and good against tokens. And both of those are bad matchups. That's the thing. Like, but tokens is eminently beatable. You just have to make it so they don't overrun you. Um, mm. And so, like, if you've got – this is going to sound silly, but it's actually great in this strategy, I think. Dejeru, I think, is a good sideboard creature uh, because Dejeru and Authority of the Councils together basically undoes their entire strategy. They can't kill your Planeswalkers in combat anymore, and Dejeru is actually just, like, eats a token, and you just buy enough time to kill them. But it's like they can't – their deck is super powerful. It's like a thousand out of ten or whatever versus versus how powerful this deck is, unless you just kill them with with, with approach of the second sun. So your your task is just to live that long, right? And to, to just to not lose all your advantages. Um, but he just he has no application for that. Like if you're gonna play Glorybound Initiate, for example, against tokens, like that's kind of a bad trade. Like they have Oh yeah, infinite ways of like beating your awesome creature with profit. Uh, infinite. I mean, he well, yeah, a large, a large, almost boundless, <laughs> bounded only by turns and mana ways of of interacting with your uh, with your awesome creature. And then I think Heart of Kieran is just misplaced here. Like it's just one of the best cards in standard that makes well, it no works sense. Well, with to Chandra's me. and Gideon's, it doesn't make no sense here. I don't know. I don't mind it here. But this deck doesn't want offense. It, it actually, even if it wanted offense, it's not... I, I don't think that that's the... Yeah, I, I, just, I don't it's think just, it is It's either. too spotty, right? Like, I think, like, if you're going to dedicate so many creatures, I think that... I would, I would pick very different creatures, is all I'm saying, yeah. right? Like, yeah. I would pick... I would pick some number... Well, I mean, I don't think... Uh, Adam's deck actually isn't equipped for this, but... If I were to take this kind of a strategy and I wanted to sideboard against Teamer, I would consider playing Wakening Sun's Avatar for the main reason that in game one, I'm not, I'm, I wouldn't play Vulnerable to Essence Scatter, but they're very liable to bring in cards like Negate and, and uh, Spell Pierce, which are great against my game one plan. But then I could bring in a card that's actually awesome against their strategy of just dumping a bunch of creatures on the table and that they wouldn't have a good interaction with after sideboarding, right? And that it's, it has also the weird text that if you had a Watley online, it won't kill your dinosaurs, which is, that's pretty cool. Um, and then I, I would consider playing Dejeru. I think that's a good creature. Um, I would definitely play Regal Caracal, but um, I just, I wouldn't try to go offense. I don't, I don't think there's enough space to go offense. What do you think of this solemnity? It would kind of get in the way of your, uh, of some of your, your compass type of action. But solemnity, players can't get counters. Counters can't be put on artifacts, creatures, enchantments, or lands. So if you have a solemnity, to begin with, people can't get energy. Yep. But what's more, they they can't get uh, they can't get uh, the treasure. Why can't they get treasure? Because it's a token? Or wait, does it not stop tokens? It's just counters? No. It stops counters. Oh, only. Yeah. God. Well, at least it stops I mean, it, it, there's, things that, there's things that require counters yeah. to, to get tokens, but yeah, I, I think this no, card I is think it's, too it's primarily, it, This card is kind of primarily for Aetherworks Marvel. I'm trying to make sure, you know, like... <laughs> just really make sure it's super dead. 
Um, yeah. the, so I, I, yeah, I didn't mean to bash Adam's strategy thing because I do think this I is a really was exciting way to go. It's and it's so different than a lot of the stuff we've seen. I just think like here's the alpha version of the deck. It has a lot of room for optimization. Like there's too many fours. There's too many fours, uh, and there's not enough like like there are some cards that would just you have tough matchups right now that that wouldn't be tough if you just smooth some of this stuff out. And like he has such good things going on, and the, it, the one of the things that's weird to me because we are criticizing the curve on the deck is that if you're going to go all the way, you're going to say I'm going to play four Sunbirds Invocation, right? It almost seems to me that you should play four Approach of the Second Sun because the Approach of the Second Sun combo on the Sunbirds Invocation is contingent on hitting an Approach of the Second Sun that's in your library still. If you're going to play seven, it's almost better to play three of the Sunbirds Invocation and four of the Approach of the Second Sun, not the reverse, which I think is not intuitive. Nah, I don't know, but I don't know if I even agree with that, though. The, the Sunbirds Invocation is a way better backup plan. Like when you're just grinding out the just like extra casting cards, two sweet things a turn for free, and not doing nothing on turn six, and instead waiting to turn seven, and then just gaining a little bit of life. Yeah, I, I did want to mention, by the way, solemnity does actually work against, uh, treasure. like, yeah, like, well, not the it's the card that makes the treasure though. Yeah, it like stops the treasure map, but it doesn't stop it doesn't, everything. It doesn't, that makes yeah, treasure. it does no, but what other treasure could you ever possibly need to stop? Captain Lannery stop storms in his deck. <laughs> Mixed treasure. Yeah, it doesn't you don't want to stop that one. <laughs> so you said something uh, a minute ago, and um, you, you said a, a similar thing before. I actually wanted to to uh, chat this out a little because one of the top decks in the in the top eight um, uh, was you know a resurgence of. The traditional blue-white approach of the second sun. A resurgence or an appearance? And it, well, I, I guess it took a week off, right? <laughs> it's back. <laughs> um, but your your position has always been that black-blue is great against blue-white approach in standard, right? Uh, has always been? Well, in the one the one time we talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, in, Fair enough. In this case, the champion... Uh, the champion black blue deck, uh, which was played by uh, the youngest champion in U.S. Nationals history by six months now, uh, beating out Mac, Matt Lindy, Oliver Tomiko. He beat uh, Peter, who was playing this blue white approach to the second son's deck in the top eight, but lost to him in the Swiss. Um, but you know, Oliver's sideboard was was quite different. Um, I don't I, actually. Where should we start? Uh, actually, I, I kind of want to talk about yeah, the so approach Oliver, deck first. Oh, I don't know. We're, uh, we're no, let's, yeah, let's talk about the approach deck while you're here. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I, I watched uh, Reed and, and uh, JVL doing a lot of the commentary this week, their position was that the blue-white approach deck was uh, a huge favorite in game one and that in a three-game set, it was, they thought that the blue-white approach deck was favored and that Oliver was most likely to win game two. Uh, Oliver won game two and game three in the top eight, and I believe. Wait, 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 wait. In the, I want to make sure I follow. I, I didn't understand this. Hold on. Sure. Are you saying that blue white was favored in game one? Yeah, they they considered it a massive favorite in game one, like almost unwinnable for black blue. That was the that was the the position that um, JVL definitely took, and Reed was like, "Yes, I believe the blue white deck is favored in game one." Huh? Because that's so weird. Because that's the same thing that. Like when when I was playing with Jerry and uh, Josh and uh, Sam and Yusa, like when I got there, they seemed to be of the opinion that blue white approach was supposed to be favored against blue black also. Yep. But then I just sat down and played against him until he agreed. <laughs> so I don't know. Like why? Like why would? Why in the world would you be favored? It with seem, blue white. It seems to me, well, I, I watched a lot of the games. I actually went back and watched all the coverage again. I just wanted to make sure I absorbed it, uh, the, the matchup. Because actually, this is really interesting to me. Blue white approach, you know, you know, this is a deck I, I played in standard a lot, and uh, one of the strategies I put some thought into. The thinking is the black blue deck has so many wasted cards in game one because it's so much stuff against creatures. Like everything from like essence scattered and extractions, all, uh, it just has a bazillion wasted cards. And that uh, it has 
the, well, this version at least, right? Um, you know, not to speak about every version. Tomiko's deck only has four disallows, so um, it can't actually it can't actually hard stop. Uh, so many things in a very, very, very long game, and that the additional search for Ascanta in the black blue deck is potentially a liability if your objective is actually just to deck them. And that, like, you don't have to try to win if you're the blue white deck. You have enough. Like, he won with, like, uh, I, don't I don't know, know what, what you call it, a, a <laughs> Torrential Gear Hulk wearing a bunch of Aether Meltdowns one game. Like, he just wasn't dealing any damage. And, yeah, you know, but man, this, doesn't make, this doesn't make any sense. This doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I mean, you're saying all this stuff, but that just doesn't line up with, I don't know, my experience. Like, I just kind of sit there and discard the hand size seven times and then eventually beat him with the Scarab God, bringing back Torrential Gear Hulk. Now, there's a difference, and maybe this build of blue-white is better. I mean, yep. he has two Gideons, which I guess is two cards that it makes it so that now he has five cards in his deck that do anything instead of three. That's at least something. Yep. But mostly this deck looks like a deck that has two Field of Ruin and four Ipnu Rivulet. And that's the plan. Yeah, he only has one Essence Scatter even. It's actually fairly trivial for... If you know his deck list, you can just play it for a long, long game where you can cover your Scarab God with, with Disallow and it's just going to win the game eventually, right? Like... Looking at looking at it from that angle, he doesn't. I thought I thought maybe he'd have more essence scatters. This deck to, no, the, the, to play against blue white approach, you got to be very 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 patient. You just wait. Don't counter the card draw. It's like the old psychotog thing. Yeah, you, you don't need oh. to counter glimmer genius. I would censor glimmer genius, but I'm not going to counter it. He's got like, what do you even need to counter besides approach of the second sun? I mean, the second approach to the second sun, even, right? Like, the first one, you're just going to let it go. You for sure let the first one go. I might counter a pull from tomorrow if it's for, like, seven or something. <laughs> yeah, you might you might deign to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. This matchup seemed really good to me, but... No, no, I, I actually... I, I hear that. I hear that a lot. It's just... I, I don't I, know. I, I totally hear you, man. I, I actually... I was just curious as, as to your approach, you know... Uh, uh, I have a lot of experience. I wait. I mostly just hang out. And, like, when I search for Azkanta, I try to get some cards in my bin so that, like, I can, like, flip it. Because, like, if you just flip the approach for... I mean, if you flip the search for Azkanta, it's so great to, like, go all the way through your deck because you can just loop all the way through your deck really fast, get those bad dead cards out, because you're going to need, like, seven or eight extra cards because you're just going to be discarding... So you have so many cards that do nothing game one. And then after sideboarding, you don't even have to play with all those cards that don't do anything. That's actually <laughs> a really important point. Like, you don't have to think about your card drawing engines or your search for as Kanta as, like, a Jame Day Tome. Maybe it's good if they're a Jalem Tome, right? Like, if you you can't avoid having all these dead cards, right? Because that's, that's what's in your deck. But if you actually just craft your hand instead of just like trying to win with bulk card advantage that's actually something that maybe people weren't weren't thinking about enough and when you blaze through your deck you got to eventually start keeping track of what's on the bottom of your deck oh yeah uh you did mention something i just want to uh, pause on that and make before we miss it you said you know the old psychic talk thing just shout out to team brazil right oh yeah so the old, when patrick says the old psychic talk thing it's so referring to Carlos Vermao, who was the 2000 world champion. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe he went 9-0 and in Psychotog Mirror Matches, 6-0 in Standard, and then 3-0 in the Top 8. I, I believe it was 9-0. and uh, Won every single Psychotog matchup. He had the maximum Psychotog tech of using uh, counter spells only to counter the card Psychotog and Upheaval and let all the Factor Fictions resolve. Uh, became a legendary master of of uh, mirror match control matchups. Carlos has had a real renaissance in his career the last couple of years, right? So he was a pro tour champion back in 2000. He's t 2002, something, and way back then, right? But he's had, you know, put up a top eight uh, recently, tons of Grand Prix success. Uh, Team Brazil, Carlos Romao, Lucas Esper Berthode, and Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa. 
I that's a hell of a squad. I hazard this Dear is the, Lord. the greatest three man team in the history of the national champion or the of the of the the type, right? Like uh three man national teams. Three it's the first three Pro Tour champion team ever in my in my recollection. Well, I don't know, man. Uh seems seems like they're gonna be uh you know, and it's well deserved, but this seems like they're gonna be uh Leading candidates, I guess. Leading uh, contenders for uh, the team championship. I mean, yeah, like, USA ain't no slouch, right? Like, <laughs> Reed Tube, no. Jerry Thompson, this is not a slouchy team, but, oh, man, Team Brazil. Okay. Uh, so talk to me about this blue-black control deck that Oliver played. Yeah, so, I think that No it, changes to the main deck. But the defining thing... I guess, he's, no, he's got two if, if new rivulets. He also split the Evolving Wild... Submerged Boneyard action. Why, wh- like Jerry, like why play uh, Submerged Boneyard like Jerry or Evolving Wilds like Sam and Josh when you can just play one Evolving Wild for Sam, one Evolving Wild for Josh, one Submerged Boneyard for Jerry? <laughs> well, um, let's uh, let's break some of that stuff down. He, uh, he, I think the defining thing in Oliver's deck is. Uh, his sideboard, he played yes. four Glint Sleeve Siphoner and four Gifted Aetherborn. So he has like much more of an aggro sideboard transformation. Uh, and it's important because he played Gifted Aetherborn instead of the 1 4 guy that Raptor played, right? So obviously a 2 the 3. Kingpin? Yeah. Contraband Kingpin? A 2 3 Death Touch Lifelink is a better aggro card than a 1 4. But again, I, this is a thing where like if you think Mono Red is going to be less popular and less successful than Gifted Aetherborn might be a better card. But, you know, pair that with Glintsleed Siphoner. So he's eight two-drop, two-power creatures that are advantage generating, right? And Glintsleed Siphoner is a great anti-control card. Imagine you're the blue-white deck across the table and he slams Glintsleed Siphoner on turn two. That's just going to go unopposed probably in sideboard and games. Yeah, I mean... I. Glitzleaf Siphoner is just an, a fantastic card anyway. And uh, I love the hitting from a different dimension, that, uh, a different direction than was the, than was being uh, targeted by uh, everyone back, you know, last week or whatever, two weeks ago at the Worlds. So is the assumption here that his deck is so good against Teamer that he doesn't have to sideboard against it? Like, the only viable card in his entire sideboard against Teamer is Gifted a- Aetherborn. And... He's got some cards in his main deck that are kind of stinkers, right? No, like what? I think Essence Extraction's pretty bad against Teamer. It's inefficient it's not... against everything, right? Like, it's... Right, but it's not that it's a stinker, though. Yeah, I It's guess... inefficient, but you would, like, you're acting like Jace's defeat is not fantastic against the Rogue Refiner, Whirler Virtuoso, the Scarab God deck. Oh, like... I guess, and he's also got, he's also got... Probably Torrential Gear Hulk and Glimmer of Genius after sideboarding against you. Commit to Right. Memory. Jace's yeah, okay. defeat is excellent. I'm in. I'm in on Jace's defeat. And then you can play some amount of gifted Aether Ward and call it a day. Yeah. It's not that you're it's not that you're so good. It's just that your main deck is so not bad. Like you there's nothing there's almost nothing bad. All you have to do is trade out these essence extractions for a little bit of an upgrade. Yeah. And- Especially on the play, Essence Extraction isn't that bad, right? Like, if you're on the play, and then they go Whirler Virtuoso, let's just, like, Essence Extraction, the, the Whirler Virtuoso, there are so many worse things you could be doing, right? Yeah, and that's, that's okay. totally fine. There are many games where you could just try to sneak an Essence Extraction against a, against a Hydra, and it's not that bad. Like, it's... Um, it's and it's not that bad, but it's uh, it's kind of a stinker, I think. I mean, compared yeah. to the other cards, right? It's no, it's no Essence Scatter, <laughs> As far as the essences go. <laughs> now, in the the finals, he defeated uh, one of my my personal magic heroes, Jerry Thompson, piloting uh, stock teamer energy. <laughs> uh, you know, I think that this is just an exemplification of uh, something I learned from you many years ago, and I've always taken to heart. If you're if you what is it if you're never brew you have no heart if you're never net deck you have no brain is that the is that is that the quote dude he did he did get a little yeah but he yeah. did get a little spicy uh, life crafters beast action in the sideboard 
Yeah, that's just, he's just he's just you know Thompson Mix angling it, it a little bit. You know, he's a, mix it up. He is the kind of guy that that'll that'll mash together two things. But I Dude, I actually I love, love the him. fact one of the top deck designers of all time, such a creative player. And just like Ugh. if you can't beat him, join him and join him all the way to second at Worlds. Yeah, and now second at nationals. That's what I meant. Second at nationals. What was going to say? Worlds, not not second. <laughs> no, 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 no. But he was like top eight, right? Well, his deck was second, or... right, or uh, thereabouts, third. Um, Mardu vehicles. Uh, Josh came in second with yeah. like same deck. Sam, right, yeah. yeah, Sam also third. Mardu vehicles, though. Ben Renato piloting uh, sort of an offspring. A little bit of the DNA of Mardu vehicles, but kind of filling out some of the missing, you know, some of the spots. Like, for instance, how do you replace Gideon, Ally of Zendikar? Well, many speculated about either Fleet Wheel Cruiser or Chandra. He went with Hazret the Fervent. Uh, I, I love it. Uh, personally, I got raffle stomped by this deck at, uh, at FNM last week, and Hazret seemed fantastic. Uh, it is, it's such an inevitable threat and, uh, in a deck that has such great early game threats, you know, like it's, it's very similar to the mono red deck. You know, you're putting out these Bomac couriers, but you're so upgraded. You've got Toolcraft exemplar and adventures apprentice, which hits so hard. It, you know, it basically forces your opponent to the corner and then you've got heart of Kieran, obviously. Right. So all the, the early game cards are so powerful. You're going to knock down so much life and then, you know. Hazard comes in. It's it's just I think kind of like playing the red aggro deck, but you have unlicensed disintegration. Oh, uh, you also have Toolcraft Exemplar, which is no joke. Oh yeah, I I appreciate a deck like he's splashing. His only white cards are Toolcraft Exemplar and Veteran Motorist. <laughs> Done. <laughs> That's so sick. Partly because he's got fifteen one drops. This is a deck that isn't. It's not relying. Like it's fine, it's great. If you get invent if you get Toolcraft Exemplar on turn one, great. Awesome. But like if you end up having to just play Spire of Industry in order to cast your uh, your Toolcraft Exemplar, that's also okay. Like you might just play a turn one inventor's apprentice, turn two, Bowmat Courier, get in there for three, and drop Toolcraft Exemplar off the Spire of Industry. <laughs> That's such. There's just such great little angles, you know, that that are coming together here. Bomac Courier just makes all these cards so much better. It's and, it, and you get this sweet rebuy on it, right? Like a deck with this many one drops can empty its hand, just get the you know pick it back up again. It, it, it's just having a deck with unlicensed integration versus other kinds of aggro decks is just two different things. Two oh, yeah. different things. Unlicensed disintegration is the real deal. Yeah, it's. Yeah, it's super great. Um, so what do you think of this sideboard with three Harsh Mentor in addition to the three Rampaging Ferocidon? So I I think Har- Harsh Mentor is a card that's been popping up, you know, in a bunch of different decks we've seen recently. Um, it's, I, I don't know, what do you think of it? It's kind of like the poor man's Eidolon of the Great Revel. So, I mean, it does a few things, right? Like, if you put it down, so, like, uh, the, the, different, the different flip lands... Like, you do get to impair slightly their uh, their actual Temple of Azkanta, but I don't think that's a particularly great use. Um, if, you're, if you're facing one of the team or energy people, they, it's, it, it, you know, it's not super practical for them to operate some of the, you know, like, whirler virtuoso aspects. But I don't know. It doesn't, I don't know. I've just never been that impressed with it. Well, it it's hard for this deck, I think, to close the deal. So, you know, this is a really I mean, good card in terms it's, of... It's, you can get a lot of non-interactive damage in, right? So you play Harsh Mentor, Circa Turn 2, against decks that have cards like... I mean, it's Evolving good against Lives. Treasure Map. It's good against Treasure Map, I guess. Well, it's unreal against any of, like, the advantage artifacts. Yeah, I don't know, man. Like, maybe the vehicle... I don't know. I guess it's fine. It's just that I always worry about, like, boarding in some dinky two-drops in your mono-red aggro deck when other people are going to be like, I was boarding in some kind of a sweeper anyway. 
you know? Like, yeah, it's like... Boarding the Harsh Mentor in against Sweltering Suns or something, I don't know. It's, uh, I think it's pretty medium high power, um, but, and it's, it, if you're just like, about transforming mana into damage, I think it's, it probably has an expected value above four. Like, I think that's, I think that's a good exchange if you can close the deal. I just think that this deck can't close the deal the same way that, that, um, a red deck in a larger format will consistently be able to do. I do like the Ferocidon now. I yeah. think the Ferocidon against some of these, like, hidden stockpile decks... All right, so yep. let's talk about the hidden stockpile deck because one of them made top eight. Yeah. So Drew Bates, Abzan tokens, two sacred cats in the main deck of this this bad boy. Um, and we, four anointed priests, of course. Yeah. So this version has got the green splash for three Vraska relic seeker. It's got one forest uh, and four evolving wilds to help set that up. Um, and roughly, you know, some renegade maps and treasure maps also can can help it get to green. Uh, but for the most part, it's like a black white token stack. It's got so anointed. So pre- it's mainly about the anointed procession hidden stockpile combination and the legions landing anointed procession combination, or hidden stockpile with legions landing. That that trinity, anointed procession hidden stockpile and legions landing. Yeah. So. Um, it produces a bunch of tokens, so it can flip Legion's Landing. Uh, in the mid-game, it can easily produce multiple tokens per turn uh, very cheaply and efficiently. Uh, and then it's got some you know, pretty good ways of setting up Fatal Push, like Renegade Map, for example, uh, Hidden Stockpile. Uh, well, and once you get going, uh, Anointed Procession with Hidden Stockpile makes it so that every turn you can sacrifice a token and make two more. Yep. Uh, or and, if you have multiple anointed processions, even more than that, can make like four. Is that right? And it's every and time, the, and every time you lesions landing, you know, you start activating your lesions landings. You're just overwhelming the board with lots and lots of one one uh, life linkers. But part of the reason for Ostadon is so important is that you gotta. You're dealing with a deck that has four anointer priest, two sacred cat, four lesions landing. This is like so much stuff that you want to be holding back, you know? You want to be suppressing. Yeah, so the cool <coughs> thing is they're making all these creatures, right? Frostodon <clears throat> likes it when they make all these creatures. Sorry. And a lot of these creatures like Vampire Tokens with Life Link are trying to, or Sacred Cats, or Anointed, but actually all of them are trying to gain life, right? And the Frostodon helps turn that stuff off too. Uh, there's also just all the token making adds up all that extra damage from the Ferocidon doing a damage for every creature that comes into play. Yep. Um, uh, out of the sideboard, though, uh, or actually, uh, before we get to the sideboard, start to finish, man. The Miser start to finish. Yeah, the start to finish itself makes two white uh, warrior creatures with Vigilance as an instant. Great combo, again, with Anointed Procession. You can make... You know, uh, you know, any any opportunity like that to can can double up for more for more uh, tokens, and then you know finish. Uh, you've got plenty of fodder for finish. Yep, including the start. Uh, anything else on this that uh, that jumps out at you? Oh yeah, so uh, you think of anointed procession as well. Two two things I, I think. One of them you think of anointed procession as a card that's great with token creatures. But it's great with any kinds of tokens, right? So Treasure Map and Vraska are really good friends with Anointed Procession, right? Like, uh, I actually saw somebody playing this at FNM, and he flipped a Treasure Map with two Anointed Processions in play. Wow. Lots and lots of treasures uh, generated from that. And then separately, uh, when Vraska is using her minus three Vindicate type ability to make a treasure... It seems so powerful to me. If you have Anointed Procession out and then you're you're firing off that Vindicate, all the treasures you're making. Um, you're, getting, you're getting two treasures? Boom. Yeah, it's just so sweet. That's that's one thing. So just remember, if you're going to play this strategy, um, you know, the treasures are, are really, really uh, synergistic with, uh, with the Anointed Procession thing. But then secondly, which is, might be a, a, a small caveat to playing this strategy, this deck requires the i think the most bookkeeping and the most remembering stuff and, and the most kind of mental energy 
you know, non-strategic mental energy of, uh, of any deck in standard right now. There's a lot of stuff to remember. Hmm. Just a, you know, just a warning. There's triggers everywhere. Like, oh, did I, did I activate my stockpile this turn? You know, how many tokens am I supposed to get with this many anointed processions in play? Um, just stuff like that. Uh, I always, when I look at these decks, I think to myself, man, I would love to have the Scarab God in there so that, like, when I'm <laughs> activating the Scarab God with Anointed Procession in play, so I can just get, like, two copies of each of the things and win even harder. So, the uh, the reigning, well, previously reigning world champion and member of Team Top Level, uh, Brian Bronduin, played an Esper version of this deck at, at Nationals uh, with... Uh, uh, champion of wits and uh the scarab god but he he did not make top eight uh what did you think of the teamer energy deck that uh, i'm sorry not teamer the sultai energy deck that jeremy sager top aided with uh you know one of those four hostage taker one the scarab god types yeah so this is very similar to the deck we talked about a couple of weeks ago that won the first open right um it's uh, it's got the combo right, so only three blossoming defense uh, in his main deck to go with those hostage takers. I don't know. Is there anything particularly different than what we've uh, we discussed previously? I, th- I think this is a this deck is a a very different set of incentives than the teamer version, even though they have a lot of stuff in common. Uh, I think that the the kind of the instants here are really help kind of I, I, how, how do i put this like it get the, the spells in this deck really facilitate the creatures in this deck and uh and like the creatures in this deck have a lot of interesting things or a lot of text that they you know you're getting paid off for and the blossoming defenses are, are really helpful there Braska's contempt is you know there's only got one in the main deck but it's awesome against things that are generally good against this kind of strategy for example a getting into the trials which is we've seen popped up in many decks I, I, I thought that Consign to Oblivion would uh, would potentially warm your heart. Oh, I love that card, yeah. So it's, a, it's, it's great. A little versatility, you know? Yeah, I mean, the, the best thing ever to Consign to it is a, uh, is a God Pharaoh's gift, I think. And then you Oblivion it. It's, it's, a, it's pretty great. <laughs> right? It's, it's uh, awesome. They're like, oh, I'm about to lock you up. I'm like, oh, actually, you're not. This, this bounces anything. So, uh, actually, jumping back to Blue Black a little, and it's another deck with Consigned to Oblivion, uh, Ian Bosley's 11th place uh, Blue Black control deck, not, you know, it's not straying too far from the norm, obviously, a little atypical having a Consigned to Oblivion in the main deck, but, you know, it's not that crazy. But in the sideboard, oh yeah, for sure, but in the sideboard, three Archfiend of Ifnir. Ooh, so, Archfiend of Ifnir is a spicy one. It's 3 BB for a creature demon. It's a 5-4 flying creature demon. And it's got cycling itself, so remember that. But it has the ability, when you cycle or discard another card, put a minus one, minus one counter on each creature your opponents control. So this card seems like an awesome answer to any number of 1-1 tokens, for example, right? Uh, That's one thing. And then separately, if you can cycle enough... Archfiend of Ifnir, or perhaps if you had two copies of Archfiend of Ifnir in play, they could take down indestructible creatures, mess with the Scarab God, stuff like that. I mean, wouldn't necessarily mess permanently with the Scarab God, but you could mess with, like, Hazaret real easily. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you need, sometimes you need uh, to throw the Scarab God a curveball. I don't yeah, know. It, Her- Hazaret, Hazaret, could just take that guy on the chin <laughs> yeah i'm saying like if the scarab god is the scarab god right but like if you're minus one minus oneing him and you're in the situation you're like here's my five drop against your five drop we've got these five uh five power five drops like you can you know you can be in a race situation it could be helpful also you can cycle this guy and then the scarab god can get him back because you are yourself of the scarab god deck you know and that i like that's a pretty powerful combo considering the impact that archfiend of Ifnir has once he's already in play. Um, that said, there's not so many cycling things, right? There's sensor and hieroglyphic illumination mostly. Or fetid pools. Fair enough. Fair enough. 
the other Archfiend of Ifnirs. Which you're just going to buy back with Scarab. Actually, this sounds like a deck, Patrick. Like, <laughs> Archfiend of Ifnirs and Scarab Gods. The only other blue-black to top 16 was good man Christian Calcano sneaking in at 16th. Uh, the only uh, atypicality there, Bantu's last reckoning in the main deck. Uh, one. Can you co-sign it? Not, not at the cost of the third search for Ascanta. <laughs> <laughs> I like me a search for Ascanta. Got to tell you. Uh, so there was a very different teamer energy deck that uh, that top uh, top sixteen. Michael Ostrowski's thirteenth place teamer energy deck, but instead of being about stuff like uh, like for instance. Despite being Teamer Energy, he's got no Whirler Virtuosos. Instead, he's playing four Green Belt Rampager, four Long Tusk Cub, three Voltaic Brawler, four Rogue Refiner, of course, and then three Ronus the Indomitable. Plus, he's got the Bristling Hydras, as always, and Heart of Kieran. Yeah, so this is like a super aggro energy deck, right? So Green Belt Rampager on the one. I guess it doesn't necessarily stick there, but... He's well, Green Belt Rampager is particularly sweet with Heart of Kieran, right? Sure. Uh, Put yeah, it for... down, it, the response, you know, trigger on the stack, yep. activate the heart, here we go. Yeah, so like Voltaic Brawler, this is like a really aggressive version. Um, I, the thing I'm, well, two things uh, I'm thinking about here. One of them, what do you think about this split between Blossoming Defense and Spell Pierce in the main, right? Two and two. Surprising. Yeah, I think it's very surprising, right? I think. Most of the stuff you want to pierce for a deck like this is this deck plays so low and so fast. You would generally be happy defensing, I think. You know, I think maybe, maybe it's for good. Okay. It's good against Fumigates, it's good against Second Sons, you know, but I think this deck probably has great re- like really great resistance to Fumigate. He's got three Ronus, four Heart of Kieran, and he's got like Greenbelt Rampager. He's always gonna have something in his hand for post Fumigate. He can't even fumigate his Ronus. He also only has nine blue. Sur- I guess the four tunes is going to make it fine. But remember, his mana base is very much set up to support these green belt rampagers. Although it is a little tight when you only have 20 land. Well, I mean, he's only two. Oh, you know, you guess he's not. He doesn't have the elf, right? He right. Have, yeah, that's the actually servant. a lot less. Because he's yes. got Heart of Kieran in the servant slot. So huh? he's like six mana sources down. I was going to say, I think it's a little odd that a deck this aggressive would play no glory bringers when the default version typically plays four glory bringers. Yeah, but you're playing six less mana. Yeah, that's a lot less mana. So, What do you um, think of this, uh, the split two Rampaging Ferocidon and two Death Gorge Scavenger? Um, I mean, Depending on which way you want to go with the life. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're very different, right? Like Death Gorge oh, yeah. Scavenger, like... It actually presents a pretty good uh, puzzle for control decks the turn that you cast it, and if it sticks around, like it messes with Search for Ascanta, can mess with the Scarab God. I think that I think it's, it's pretty cool. Rampaging Frostodon, I'm puzzled by though. I guess to- if you're if you're worried about getting brickwalled by tokens, is that is that where it is? It's for tokens. Yeah, I think yeah, it's, it's, it is excellent. It's a fantastic card against these Obzon token decks, like the one we just discussed earlier. Yeah, I, I mean think- it's. I think I'd play more than two then. Because I think this this deck looks like a dog to the tokens deck to me. Especially, it also, like, it seems like this deck is, it's pretty, pretty, you know, high variance in the early turns. Like, you can get, like, an amazing opening curve, or you can get, like, a little choppy, and then your cards aren't very good. They're not not good, but, like, the quality of your draw in the mid-game is going to fall behind. So... If you're going to be in a situation where the opponent's actually got a game plan that's great at brickwalling your game plan, I think you need to invest in more Rampaging Ferocidons. That's that's my conclusion. Uh, I, did you see over at the SCG Open, uh, it was taken down by Justin Gregory with Esper Gift and a second Esper Gift deck in the top four in the hands of Brennan DeCandio. Uh, a I tournament for Esper Gift. Yeah, Esper Gift... Uh, with uh, four Seeker Squire, like the you know the one we talked about a few weeks ago. Yep. A couple of kite sa- kite sail freebooters and uh, four Hostage Taker. 
But the big thing here being the addition of three search for Azkanta as a new twist. So last week you were talking a little bit about a Black Blue Pirates deck, and you're thinking, hey, maybe Black Blue Pirates is viable. I kind of like, you know, this card and this card and this card. I thought that was actually what I was really reminded of when, when looking at these Esper Gifts deck this week. I was like, oh, this is a lot like just a Black Blue Pirates deck, but then it has this other awesome engine attached to it. And you actually get the benefit, a lot of those Pirates interactions, um, you know, still get to play the powerful... When I say Gifts engine, you know, it's a... Oh, what, what, ha- what a Pirate interactions are you really playing? We're just having the pirates, you know, like the pirates. Oh, just having them. You're just having them, you know, like <laughs> all the reasons you would want to play the pirates. Besides Arr. the pirateness. Yeah, the pirateness. Okay. You know, okay. a lot of them are there, you know. and they just, Including the, the dead eye tracker in the in sideboard, sideboard yeah. for when you need more pirates. So so many exclusions. Good in the mirror. I mean, like, Brennan's got a fourth kite sale freebooter in the sideboard. And then there's, like, pirate the themes. Where's the third? Uh, I'm looking at Brennan's deck. He's got three oh, right. in the main and one, one free burn on the side. Uh, and he's got pirate-themed cards. He's got Walk the Plank and Brass's Contempt. This is very, very swashbuckling. Mm. Uh, so uh, the second place deck, though, Marsh making his uh, making a return. Uh, former national team member himself. With a ramen up red redux. And Marsh loves red aggro decks, it's to my recollection. So this is just super right in his uh right in the center of his uh wheelhouse. And this is this is a pretty straightforward one, but uh I guess, you know, sometimes if it ain't broke. Yeah, I, I it's like... interesting how different of a metagame they had over at the open. There's levels to this stuff. Yeah, I think like I think that Mono Red is probably just a really good deck still. It just depends on what decks other people are playing. Like, if everybody's playing Teamer, the Mono Red's just going to get slaughtered, right? But if everyone's playing Teamer, there's decks that prey on Teamer, you know? Like, And I don't think it's one of those formats where any of the decks are so far and away more powerful than the other ones that they're, that they're um, you know, it becomes, like, mathematical to, to play that deck. I mean, I don't know. Maybe Black Blue is a uh, is a bit better than the other ones, um, but not overwhelmingly so, right? Like you don't you wouldn't say that. I, I think I would just guess you would think Black Blue is uh, is maybe the best of the known decks to play, but it's not like. Oh no, I don't know. I don't better. know. I would have I would have played Teamer Energy this past week. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, what do you think of uh, Marsh's list versus something like Travis Bryant? He finished fourth with a version that was effectively just a ramen up red deck, but he splat. He was doing the Captain Lannery Storm thing, but he was using the treasure to help enable a black splash of just four bone picker and then a cut to ribbons and four fatal push. I love the cut to ribbons. I think that is awesome. Uh, I think it gives a dimension that um, the deck would love. You know. Uh, just the additional early interaction is useful. And then ribbons, I, I can't say it comes out of nowhere because people can see when it's going to come, right? So that's, I think, a great a great thing to add. But I think bone picker's kind of weird. Uh, okay, so here, let me walk you through the bone picker scenario. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Turn three, Captain Lannery Storm, get in there. Are you going to block, trade? Okay. Yeah. See where I'm going with this? Bone picker. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, then you use the treasure to play the bone picker, and then you get the you know, then you get the money and Yeah, but there's four the swamp power. and two if near deadlands in this deck. Right? Like like swamp is just not a card I want to have in my I guess there's no red one drops in this deck. This is a slower build of, of fast but red aggro. If I'm going to play a fast red aggro black that's that's uh, splashing for black and has a bunch of artifacts, right? Like, <laughs> he's got <laughs> Captain Lantern Storm, Bone he's got Courier. Bone Mac Courier. I don't understand why he would play Bone Picker instead of um, Scrap Heap Scrap Scrap Scrounger. <laughs> but forget about that stuff. <laughs> Where is a license disintegration? I mean, if you're going to stretch, just. <sighs> 
a wise man named Patrick Chapin once told me, Wait a minute. if you're just going to roll dice, at least roll the ones with the highest numbers on them. <laughs> That's a wise I man. I mean, said. an acceptable shortcut, assuming that the goal of the game is to roll big numbers. Yeah. Top 16, Kyle McLean with Mono White Monument. Now here's the deck. Yes. Yes. To begin with, four... A Danto Vanguard for value. Four Duskborn Sky Marcher. Oh, wait, is that eight vampires? Three Bishop Soldiers. That's 11 right there. Two Inspiring Cleric. That's 13. Four Legions Conquistador. And then once you add in the Paladin of the Bloodstained and the Maverin Fane Dusk Apostle, this is just full-on mono-white vampires. Plus, so, that's not even counting three legions landing. Yeah, so this deck... I I hope this deck is good. It seems <laughs> like so cool. Uh, you know, one of the main combos here is Oketra's Monument plus uh, Legion Conquistador. That's a Absolutely. really, really cool combo. So Oketra's Monument um, obviously allows you to discount your white spells by one. That make, Legion's Conquistador makes it like a 2-2 two, two, draw three for two, which is fantastic. And you get like every Legion's Conquistador is just snowballing the value of Oketra's Monument, which is very, very powerful. Uh, Oketra's Monument and Legion's Landing is a weird court of, sort of combo, right? Like, uh, Legion's Landing doesn't trigger Oketra's Monument, but o- what Oketra's Monument does is so good with what Legion's Landing does. I think that's pretty cool. Um, this is, uh... I mean, o- 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 uh, Oketra's Monument flips Legion's Landing, though. Yeah. Just, I mean, that's a pretty big deal. You, you could but, just play Legion's Landing after you have like creatures and play for Oketra's Monument, right? And then just ride the ride yeah. the, the value that turn. There's also four aviary mechanics to combo with the uh, Oketra's Monument. If you get two of the mechanics going, then every mana is another 1-1 one, one white warrior with vigilance. Because you just keep bouncing them back and forth, you know? Yeah. And if you don't pull off the combo, you can still do like aviary mechanic to bounce your uh, your inspiring cleric, gain a little extra life, or uh, or potentially play limited staple paladin of the bloodstained. You know, you play paladin of the bloodstained, make a one one with life link. You bounce the paladin, play it again. <laughs> paladin of the bloodstained is uh, stretching my patience. I gotta say, it's that <laughs> one. Or you bounce Angel of Invention, come back down with two more servos. I mean, so, Patrick, so let's say that you were going to optimize this deck a little bit. Would you would you keep the Paladin of the Bloodstain instead of, say, playing three or even four Angel of Inventions in the main deck? I would have a lot of trouble playing Paladin of the Bloodstain instead of Angel of Invention. I think I would play four Angel of Invention, and the Angel of Invention seems like, like I don't know. Angel of Invention seems like it's great, and uh, even if you—I I don't know—I would, I would, I would start by wanting to try more Angel of Inventions. It seems so good with the rest of the deck. Yeah, I think uh, for me, for Angel of Invention is a hard yes. I think that there, I think this deck is cool. Um, I, think I think this is super cool. This is my favorite deck of the weekend. I think there's there's stuff I would want to try with it. I think I would want to have access, even not not in the main deck, to get into the trials. Um, it's just a such an easy thing to play in a deck like this to just have access to it gives you such such breathing room against um uh against blue white approach of the second sun uh i also just question how much do you really need 24 vampire cards like your only vampire payoff i mean okay i guess technically dustborn sky marcher is a quote-unquote payoff but like You've got three Maverin Fane. To begin with, I would play four Maverin Fane, I think. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe I'll play three because I would want to trim the number of vampires. Because, like, even though you can do some of that stuff, how much mileage are you really getting out of this 2 2 lifelinker and the, like, 1 1 uh, vampire that becomes a 3 1 indestructible? And... I-, I think Maverin Fane is. Look. 
no one's saying that the the vampire payoffs in and of themselves are so big, but Mayhem Fan is probably the biggest of the vampire payoffs, right? Oh yeah, which is part of the reason why I'm a little surprised to have only three if you're going to play 24 vampires. Um, I agree. Uh, but I don't know. I wouldn't mind playing only three because I don't think I would want 24 vampires. The But the one thing that I would, would really, really am questioning on this deck, especially given the number of Legion Conquistadors that is in it, which are three casting cost cards, um, is only 21 lands. I think like... I know. I the, can't get it. I, I need a couple more, please. The, the blue-white version, which, uh, you know, had cards like, you know, that could help draw cards... Uh, had 25 lands so that's uh that's where i my my eye is uh is uh trailing off to i think this deck needs so much operating mana for like if you have like the oketra's monument aviary mechanic combo going you're going to be happy to have extra lands right like so it seems like yeah. to me so uh what would you think of crested sun Marin in here um you got Legion's Landing, making a life linker. You've got uh, Angel of Invention sideways, Bishop Soldier, Inspiring Cleric. You know, and you could tweak a few other things to uh, to help make it a reality. I mean, I'm I'm never going to turn down a Crescent Sun Mary. You know that. There's three Authority Councils in the sideboard. I'm even triggering on their turn. Uh, the the major tension I'd say is one of the cards you named, which is Angel of Invention, is also a five. Right, like yeah, that's pretty hard. I, I just don't, I don't tolerate like <laughs> eight fives in my in my twenty one land deck. Like, there's a lot of tweaks that have to be made between hither and thither. What do you think of glory bound seeker or pouncing uh, like adorned pouncer? Uh, I don't know that I like those better than a Danto Vanguard in this deck. I think a Danto Vanguard's pretty good in this deck. Well, yeah, but what about the two, the bishop? I like the bishop in this deck too. Really? Those are actually those are the, they're the rock for me, man. That's where that's where I start. The bishop? Yeah. The two two life linker? Yeah. Uh, the bishop soldier? I would play a fourth one. If if that's like the given, then maybe I'm out. Maybe I'm off it. But why why tell me like first of all, I think inspiring cleric's a pretty good card, but I don't know why I would play a second inspiring cleric before I played a fourth bishop soldier. I'm not saying you have to play any of these. They just have to be better than the Scarab God. Nobody, Patrick, we determined last week the Scarab God is the best. We're looking for all Scarab God alternatives right now. Okay. Nobody's better than the Scarab God. Here's an alternative for you. Uh, So that dinosaur, uh, from the the white dinosaur that, uh, dude, where is he? The six drop. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, the combo card. Where is this dude? No idea his name. Have not drafted this guy. Bellowing Aegisaur. So, five and a white for a three five within rage. Whenever Bellowing Aegisaur is dealt damage, put a plus one, plus one counter on each other creature you control. Playable in draft. Definitely. Um, which brings us to constructed. <laughs> <laughs> so picture, if you will, you've got a couple of bellowing Aegisaurs. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you so far. <laughs> and a walking ballista. Yeah. Is that, a, is that just a straight up combo? Yeah, they're dead. You don't normally need that much because realistically... If you just have a bellowing Aegisaur and a walking ballista, you, they're probably dead anyway. Because if you're playing like an Enraged deck, you can trigger, you proc all your stuff and you do all this craziness. But like, wait. Yeah, they're dead. Maybe, should this just be played in God Pharaoh's Gift? Maybe. I mean, it costs six. Yeah, but, like, God Pharaoh's Gift kind of doesn't care about that. And the, like, it's, I'm just thinking about walking ballista decks that can cast Bellowing Aegisaur. Well, so, interestingly, if you've got the mana to do it, the Scarab God can sub in 
Like, you can bellowing Aegisaur uh, five times, then the Scarab God a bellowing Aegisaur back and do it five more times. But, yeah, in general, if you just have two bellowing Aegisaurs, you win. If With the walking ballista. That is monster. I told I, you, and that, that there's that, that could actually there could be something there. So there's a couple things you can do with this. There are so, so like, many great combo decks that are full of horrible cards you would never want to play in other contexts. So, <laughs> and to be able to play Walking Ballista, that's not a horrible card. I mean, no, that's a admittedly, very card. a couple of copies of Bellowing Aegisaur is a big ask. But um, there are some things you can do. Like for instance, Kinjali's Caller makes dinosaur spells cost one less. That's something, right? And then uh, that priest, priest of the Awakening Sun, white for a one one at the beginning of your upkeep. You can reveal yep. a dinosaur from your hand if you do gain two life. And it has five sack priest of the Awakening Sun. Search your library for a dinosaur, so you can go get a bellowing Aegisaur. Or, or depending on the situation, you can go get uh, Big Papa himself, Gishath Sun's avatar. The seven six trample vigilance haste when it deals combat damage to a player, reveal that many cards from the top of your library, put any number of dinosaur creature cards from among them onto the battlefield with the rest on the bottom. So you can just play all the di- like you I mean, if you're playing like a full on dinosaur deck and you have one Gishas, like if it gets them, they are gotten. I mean, is this is it insane to play Sunbird's invocation to play these cards? Like, like you could just cast an expensive walking ballista, right? Is that that work, right? And then go find that works. Aegisaur? That works. Well, the the other thing you can do is uh, where is it? Oh, so you can Sahili Rai. Sahili oh. Rai, not banned, not banned. No. Nope. If you have a Sahili Rai in play, you can actually copy your bellowing Aegisaur so that you don't actually need to have two. You know, you could just, if you just have a walking ballista in play and a Saheeli Rai, which is a big ask, but it's less ambitious. That's, a, that's not can, that big of an ask, right? You're, you might also surprise him, hit him out of nowhere. You could just go like, you know, six mana bellowing Aegisaur. Your opponent's just like, what kind of doofus plays bellowing Aegisaur? They tap out, and you're like, seventh mana, Saheeli Rai, two casting costs, walking ballista, get you. Right? Like, that's... That seems like a pretty natural curve for a deck with Bellowing Aegisaur. You know, I mean, that's kind of cool. Yeah, this is I, you're cool. blowing my mind, man. Like, I think <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. Dude, I think there's still time. Like, so, okay. I don't know if we actually want any treasure or anything, but I think the big question to come down to is, are we talking more like a Saheeli Rai deck or are we talking more like a dinosaur deck? You could potentially do both, I guess, but I, I suspect they're going to take you in opposite directions. Because I think that it, part of the advantage to playing dinosaurs is that I think commune with the dinosaurs is such a good tutor to try to find your Aegisaurs. And then getting you can play Drover of the Mighty, which is not the most insane, but if you just want to have a little... Va- if you're on some kind of a backup plan. Yeah, I, I buy it to the degree that... I mean, obviously commune with dinosaurs but, is awesome. Part of it is that you're going to set up the whole... Like, you've got this backup plan of Ripjaw Raptor. Because, like, if you have Ripjaw Raptor in play when you drop the Bellowing Aegisaur and then you start just firing with a Walking Ballista, if you have a 2-2 Walking Ballista in play in a Ripjaw Raptor, when you drop the Bellowing Aegisaur, you just deal 10. Like, you, you make your Ripjaw Raptor... Uh, a, a nine, a, a nine, ten, and you draw five extra cards, <laughs> and that's yeah, not counting the, if you have anything else. The ballista ripjaw raptor is itself a pretty cool combo, right? And I mean, what if you have the the, the accelerator that uh, ranging raptor? So I I think I don't like the dinosaur version of this deck, and I, I think the you'll agree with my reason why. I think if you play it as a combo deck and you're like just optimized to put together the cards to combo kill your opponent, then that's that's awesome. Uh, but if you're just playing these good cards that can come together in a certain way, I think you're asking for it. Scarab God's going to get you. Like, like, like time is not on your side against black blues removal cards and the fact that the Scarab God just lands and then whatever awesome thing you had is theirs now. 
That's the All thing right. I'd be afraid of. You you have to be you got to be knife to the jugular speed, not not All right. uh, grind. You want speed. knife to the jugular speed? How about this? You can sub in either instead of a second bellowing Aegisaur, you could just have a second walking ballista or you could have a winding constrictor. Eh? Winding constrictor is a good magic card. Second walking ballista is not that bad either. No. Like, you could be, like, there's so many little pieces you could put together, man. Yeah. All right. Well, good talk. All right. That's a project. All right. Um, Good talk. To be continued after somebody helps us tune and break this list. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, Be sure to, uh, if you could, follow us on the social media, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and, of course, Michael J's favorite, the Patreon. And in particular this week. In particular this week. Sure. Shout out to David Brannon. Thank you, David. Uh, like Thank you for helping make it possible for us to be here every week. Because, yeah. dude, particularly with magic, like kind of with the standard format, kind of taking a sweet turn. And uh, next week, maybe we dabble a little into modern, which is taking a sweet turn too. Oh, Not even yeah. a sweet turn. Modern's been sweet, but it's just more like whiffs of sweetness. Throughout the air, like you're walking by a cookie store. I there's just homemade cookies. I love modern that. scent blowing out. Modern is my favorite format to play. I'm looking forward to talking about it next week. All right, dude. All right. Well, bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Life didn't work so great. Tried to play dredge, it's a jailer hate. Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core trapped in amber stasis. Lost a lot of friends, got left behind.